Welcome back. We are digging into the details of tomorrow's historic federal arraignment of Donald Trump in Miami. My panel is still with me, Carol Lennig, Anthony Coley, Glenn Kirshner, and Sarah Matthews. Anthony, talk about the biggest obstacles that the Justice Department is going to face tomorrow. So, you know what I worry about as a oh. communications person? I worry about the rhetoric and the misinformation that's coming out from Trump and his Republican allies. Um, who are calling this Merrick Garland's prosecution? Right, which is not the case. What the attorney general did back in November was put in place an independent, a career prosecutor to lead, uh, to come to, to, to his own determination, his prosecutorial decision about whether or not charges should be brought. What people don't realize about Jack Smith is that you remember this, Stephanie, he was the one who led the prosecution against John Edwards, the Democratic senator of mm -hmm. North Carolina. He doesn't have a political bone in his body. But I worry, going back to my first point about this rhetoric, this misinformation, Republicans are not arguing against the facts, right? They, uh, there's a saying in legal circles that if you don't have the law on your side, you argue the facts. And if you don't have the facts on your side, you argue the law. And if you don't have either on your side, you pound the table. Or you pump inf you pump misinformation, right. That's which is exactly right. what Trump is doing. Right. And it may work for him in the court of public opinion, but not a court of law. Glenn, then what do you do with that, right? What do you expect Donald Trump's defense to look like? Because right now the defense from Republicans is, look at Hillary Clinton, look at Joe Biden, arguments that hold no water to those who actually know the facts. Yeah, you're exactly right, Steph. And those might be arguments that you can throw into the court of public opinion. They are inadmissible in a court of law. So it's a great question. What does Donald Trump's defense look like? Well, first of all, not even Donald Trump knows at this point, because two of his lawyers who had been on the case long term just quit. He's got a new lead counsel, and they are going to be starting from square one, trying to formulate a defense. I suspect what the defense will look like, Steph, is um, basically what we call a reasonable doubt defense. You know, if you have an alibi defense, right, in the more typical violent crime case, you present an alibi defense. You try to prove to the jury that you were nowhere near the crime scene. If you have a misidentification defense, you present it. If you have self-defense, you present it. If you really don't have any viable defense based on the available facts, you present a reasonable doubt defense. What does that look like? It looks like the defense team just sort of attacking every witness, every shred of evidence. They might claim that tapes, audio tapes, or some kind of deep fakes, they will try to distract and dissemble and deceive, quite frankly, and try to create reasonable doubt in at least one juror. Maybe they play for an 11 to 1 a uh, hung jury, and then they have to force the government to decide whether whether to retry the case. I suspect you're going to see a scorched earth, reasonable doubt defense when this case finally goes to trial. Which is exactly why they would want to pump out so much misinformation right now to create that doubt among potential jurors. Carol, what do you make of this argument that Trump has now lost two lawyers? He's having a hard time finding another lawyer. Do you really think that's the case? Or is this Trump just running the clock? Because the longer it takes to re-staff up for that team to then get up to speed takes more and more time, and time has proven to be Trump's friend. Well, I couldn't agree more with you about Trump's delaying tactics as being critical to most of his legal defense. But I have to say, I feel like I have written the story that my colleagues wrote today about seven times about Donald Trump. And that is, he's hunting for a lawyer, and when he knocks on the door, a lot of people are saying no. Now, the people that said no to Donald Trump when he was looking for a lawyer, when Robert Mueller was a special prosecutor investigating contacts between Russian operatives and Trump campaign aides, the people that were turning down mm -hmm. Donald Trump then were people that all of us recognized. They were household names, Ted Olson, uh, Bill Bennett, people who had had all sorts of incredible white collar defense work and were national names. They were saying, you know, this Donald Trump would politely decline. They had heard the stories that he doesn't take people's advice, that he likes to litigate through the press. He leaked 
He doesn't listen to his lawyers. And sometimes he doesn't pay them or he pays them not as much as their actual bills are. So that's an issue. Now we are in the you know seventh iteration of legal challenges facing Donald Trump. And again, he is struggling to find counsel to represent him. I think that Glenn's right that there are going to be people starting from scratch, which is not too great. And what our sources have told our colleagues at the Washington Post is the lawyers have different perspectives about how to go with this case. Do they listen to their client who wants to rip apart the Department of Justice and accuse them of, of bias and political Machiavellian motivations? Or do they want to go for excluding evidence? How about excluding all of Evan Corcoran's tapes and, and relitigating whether or not the attorney-client uh, privilege should have been breached? That's a real risk in this case, a pretty good approach for good lawyers, actually. But um, these are the two arguments going on right now between whoever represents Donald Trump has to choose one that their client likes, and that's going to be hard. Sarah, when somebody is in this kind of legal trouble, one would think this is where they are putting their hands in the air and the lawyers are in charge. Who do you think is in charge of Trump world right now? I think that Trump is in charge of Trump world, as evidenced by you know his lawyers leaving his legal team that were working on this case. I think that he is deciding what the narrative is here, which is that he's going to play the victim card, that he um, was absolved from any wrongdoing, and then he's going to try to distract and uh, pit the blame on others. And that's what I worry about with uh, the other person who's being charged, um, his valet, um, because the thing is that with Trump, he demands loyalty from everyone, but he gives no loyalty to anyone in return. And so I do hope that uh, Walt is getting good, sound advice from his loved ones on uh, not to be the fall guy for Trump here, because um, unfortunately, I think there was some new reporting that he has a lawyer that's being paid for by Trump. And so in that case, I would think then that the lawyer is looking out for Trump's best interests and not Walt's. All right, then. Carol Lenning, Anthony Coley, Glenn Gershner, Sarah Matthews, thank you all so much.